that this morning we'll, we, we will learn how to not wait so we can just be in this present moment. So it is my pleasure to welcome one of the finest jewels in our Temple of Light family. She's a practitioner, a master goldsmith and craftsperson. Is it craftsperson or craftsman? Craftsperson. And I'm sure is bringing you a message this morning that will light that light within you. Please help me welcome Mrs. Carol Campbell. Good morning. And welcome to the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living. Again. And to those of you who are listening on the World Wide Web, a special welcome from us in sunny Jamaica. It's so beautiful here right now. Balmy, beautiful weather. How are you all this morning? Good. Well, we're going to get even better. <laughs> I have a little story to tell. The last words he said as she drove down the driveway were, don't get lost now. Call me when you get to the turn off to Anata Bay. She relaxed. Knowing the road was straight, it was not yet night, and confident she would not need to call for help. She'd been down that road before, literally and figuratively. The turn off to Anata Bay at the roundabout looked much the same as the turn off to Kingston. And even though she knew Kingston was her destination, she remembered the words, and not obey, and blithely set off in the wrong direction. Even though every inward sensor set off warning signs in her head. Angry at finding herself in the middle of Port Antonio on the darkest night ever, she called her friend and berated him for sending her in the wrong direction. Which, of course, he calmly assured her was due to her misunderstanding and refused to assist the damsel in distress. Men do have that infuriating way. Eventually, fuming, she turned the car around, made her way back to the roundabout, and with no better option than to rely on her own internal GPS, that's her God pilot system, since it was now pitch black and the signs and road marks were not terribly visible, even in daylight, <laughs> she got home to Kingston safe and sound. But she was not happy. <laughs> Life is much like a journey into what you think is familiar territory, which instead lands you in reg regions unknown, looking down a long, dark road sometimes, trying to negotiate your way in spite of blinding headlights approaching and the occasional feeling of, where the heck am I? Now there are some important lessons from this experience. Key lessons for me here are, one, watch your thoughts and the ideas you say yes to. The results speak for themselves. Now even though I told myself I didn't need to call for help, my dominant thought was, I'm going to get lost because I always get lost. Watch your thoughts. Number two, proper preparation of your head space, your heart space, your soul space is essential for successful outcomes. I should have been better prepared when I drove down that driveway. Number three, the law doesn't play favorites. It responds to you at the level of your request. Four, trust your intuition your inner teacher. It never leads you astray. Sometimes you have no other choice. And five, there is no confusion in the one mind. All is always in divine order. Now I'm going to try and unravel these lessons one by one for you. Number one, watch your thoughts. We're told in the Bible, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So what is your dominant thought pattern? Are you victor or victim? 
Do you deal at the level of cause or effect? What do you understand the indwelling God to be? Now, to my mind, that can be nothing less than the source of wisdom and power that is already within us. My own true self must be that part of God within me, which releases through me the energy, vitality, and joy of the Lord, also known as the law, also known as God. Say with me, I'll say it first. I am alive and vital for God's ideas fill my consciousness. I am alive and vital for God's ideas fill my consciousness. Now for us to truly embody this and get comfortable with the idea, it is essential that we release the belief about God as person, as personality, or even as supreme being, and simply regard it as pure spirit and spirit alone. God is not a spirit, as that would suggest there is more than one. God is spirit, that unbounded essence of all that is, without specific form or definition, but yet the source of all form and substance. It is that great no thing that is in everything. It is our individual choices, however, that define what God is for each of us. And only when we clarify what that means for us are we in a position to use God, the law, effectively. Otherwise, we're just mouthing words. Those of us who grew up with the notion that God is Jesus, for instance, and equate Jesus with God, that's not incorrect, in essence. But that tends to set up Jesus as the exception, outside of us, inaccessible. Therefore, if Jesus is God, God is outside of us, inaccessible. And there's no way that us mere mortals can have that relationship with God. We all know, should, should that that's not true. Try wrapping your mind around the indefinable substance that animates all that is. That is the very essence of you and me. So, is God power? Then we are powerful. Is God strength? Then we are strong. Is God joy? Then we are joyful. You get the picture? Whatever God is to you, you express. So if you choose to align yourself, for instance, with the God of the Old Testament, the vengeful, dictatorial, warmonger God, then that becomes your experience of God, and you accept that you are punishable by your mere existence. Now that remains true for you until you change the way you think about God and perhaps align yourself with the New Testament version of God as love and compassion. Not quite such a scary proposition now, right? Remember, God has no other way of showing up except through the creations such as we are. We have to consciously create the way, deliberately open the door, and clear the channel if we want to see the activity of God in our lives. Dr. Holmes, writing in the Science of Mind textbook, pages 79 and 80, has said, and I quote, if we study the true nature of man, then we shall have delved into the real nature of God. Here's an affirmation for you. I choose this day to discipline my mind to accept only positive, empowering thoughts. I'll break it down. I choose this day to discipline my mind to accept only positive, empowering thoughts. Hold on to that idea. The day has just begun. <laughs> Lesson number two. Proper preparation of your headspace your heart space, your soul space, is essential 
for successful outcomes. Now, if you're setting off on a journey, or even just to set off to work, proper preparation would mean making decisions that ensure the events unfold with ease, peacefully, joyfully, with good all around. Not so? You would know where you're going, how you plan to get there, what activities you'd like to participate in when you arrive, and that the people you meet along the way contribute to and benefit from the interaction. Right? While remaining flexible to a better way, we set our intention to have a fabulous day. So what are you going to do if some mindless road user splash you from head to toe in your beautiful suit all dressed up for an important meeting? You can choose to give them some choice ones, or you can choose to breathe love and peace into the situation, remembering your declaration to have a peaceful, perfect day. You'll be forgiven the condition of the suit. You, however, may not be forgiven the condition of your mental headspace that causes you to give him a few choice ones, right? Because life is very fair. What you send out comes back to you. The journey of life is continuously unfolding, like flower petals. And depending on the situation, releases exquisite perfume or foul odors. Well, as our Declaration of Principles states, we believe in the control of conditions through the power of the one mind, which we call God, the living spirit almighty, which is in all of us. This is the source and substance of our intelligence and wisdom. We engage it, it responds to us in kind. Emma Curtis Hopkins, one of the first teachers, she actually was Ernest Holmes' teacher. She said in her book, Unveiling Your Hidden Power, I quote, within each of us is the joyful song of the spirit. Let us choose to imagine life holy and omnipresent, end quote. Here's another affirmation for you. The spirit that I am is joyous and sings because spirit is joy. Today is a joyful song. Say it. The spirit that I am, spirit that I am. Is, joyous and sings is joyous and sings because spirit is joy. Today is a joyful song. Turn to your neighbor and say, Today is a joyful song. <laughs> Lesson number three. The law doesn't play favorites. It responds to you at the level of your request. Now everybody's familiar with the phrase in the Bible, ask and it shall be given. We're also told God is all there is. Therefore, there can be no lack. So my question, what exactly are we asking for if God as omnipresence is already everywhere in all things? We're also told in Matthew 6, verse 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. But if God is already in everything I can imagine, how can my wanting the things of God be separate from wanting God? Good question. Think about it. If God is everywhere, then the kingdom of God must also be everywhere, and therefore nowhere in particular. How can we seek something that is the great no thing? <laughs> it is not in the seeking but in the finding, by making the thing particular to us. That is how we add all things to our experience. Can you say, I am God also? I am God also. How do you feel saying that? Do you believe it? <laughs> I'm not convinced. <laughs> Say it with conviction, because it's the truth. I am God 
also, okay, the same way that Jesus is a manifestation of the God presence, he is the great example for us, not the exception. He recognized that within himself. That is his Christhood. And he said, follow my lead. He never said, worship me. Okay, so if you're going to follow this great example, you have to be comfortable with the idea, I am God also. Greater things than these shall you do. Not so? Okay. <laughs> The notion that somehow seeking God is loftier than seeking a beautiful home with all the trimmings can be a little confusing until we see this correctly. There is no need to separate and compartmentalize God. God is infinite life. So seeking the highest and best in any expression or manifestation is seeking God. Now my highest ideal is personal to me as is each person's. If my highest idea of transportation, for instance, is cosmic teleportation, that is no godlier than someone whose highest idea is a brand new bicycle. Our choices change as we change and grow and learn to accept more, to express more God as more love, more abundance, more joy, more peace, more etc. It doesn't make one better or more spiritual or more conscious than the next person. It just means we become more aware of our potential as God expressing and of life's infinite possibilities. God, life, source, knows how to convert our thoughts and ideas into form, just as precisely as it can turn a tomato seed into a bountiful harvest of plump tomatoes. When we cease to struggle with accomplishing the form of the desire and instead be open and receptive, surrendering to the idea of limitless supply, of being in the flow of lavish, abundant good, being in receive mode rather than want mode, we open the access channel for the manifest desire to come flooding into our experience. I have a question. Are you ready to receive? <laughs> that is an acronym for the steps of treatment. Are you ready to receive? Recognition, unification, realization, thanksgiving, and release. <laughs> Here's another affirmation. I claim total satisfaction and perfect serenity as my daily experience. I claim total satisfaction and perfect serenity as my daily experience. Remember that. Lesson number four. Trust your intuition. Your intuition is your inner teacher, literally. It never leads you astray. As long as we're alive and kicking, there's something active within us that wants to express through us as abundant life, as unquenchable joy, as abundant prosperity. There is a divine intelligence within everyone that surpasses and supersedes any formal education. It's when we know without benefit of analysis or instruction. This inner knower wants the best for us, always, and will always lead us down the right path, no matter how much we resist and let our ego get in the way. It is the ego that craves details and wants everything figured out because it's too scared to trust. But when we're out of options, like our friend traveling to Kingston, we discover that we don't have to have all the answers all at once. We can allow them to be revealed as we need them. I really had no idea how to get to Kingston from Port Antonio in the daytime, much less in the dead of night. And let's face it, the car lights only show you a few yards ahead at a time. I always tell myself when I get off track, and John stop laughing, <laughs> I always remind myself, Jamaica is really not that big. 
how lost can I really get? <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then I surrender the panic and just relax and let my intuition guide me. So far, it's proven to be the most reliable GPS. And trust me, I've used it plenty. <laughs> that too. <laughs> Lesson number five. There is no confusion in the one mind. All is always in divine order. Now this I can declare with confidence because as our principles state, we believe in God. One indestructible, absolute, and self-existent cause. And besides me, there is no other. We are part of the universal whole, a wave in the ocean of God, flowing with the rhythm of life. Raymond Charles Barker, one of our luminaries, said, and I quote, order is heaven's first law, end quote. Now, this is an infallible law that we can trust completely. Do you ever think that you'd wake up one morning to find the sun has risen in the west? Or that tomato seeds grow ochres? I don't think so. Nor do we have any doubt that rain will be wet, and snow will be cold, and fire will be hot. We trust that because we've experienced that. But what if we never had such an experience? What if we had only our faith to lean on? What if we found ourselves in the midst of experiencing something described as a life-threatening illness? Where would we choose to put our faith? In the diagnosis or in the principle of perfection? In the fact of the experience or in the truth of our divine inherent wholeness? The choice is ours. There is a peace that accompanies the realization that we are fully supported on our journey through life, and that however the experience of the moment might appear, we are assured that the result will be for our highest good. More often though, it's kind of hard to see the forest for the trees. A few years ago, I got a doctor's report, which said I had some <clears throat> wayward cells getting busy in my womb. Well, if I told you I took the news with calm assurance, I'd be lying. <laughs> I went into a tailspin, momentarily lost my footing, and slid down the rabbit hole. Good thing I had good friends who grabbed hold of me before I hit rock bottom and pulled me out with assurances that divine order always prevailed. Turned out it was a false report, and I had nothing to worry about. <laughs> I have since learned to trust that knowing, regardless of appearances. For whatever it is will change, because experiences are not written in stone. They are transient. They have come to pass. So let them pass. Knowing this, I can decide to let nothing disturb my peace of mind. Can you? Try it. <laughs> I leave you with this reminder from Emma Curtis Hopkins. There is good for me, and I ought to have it. Believe it? Yes. Declare, I live, me, me. <laughs> I live in the kingdom of good. I live in the kingdom of good. That's my current location. That's my current location. And I'm perfectly at home there. And I'm perfectly at home there. Enjoy the rest of the day, the rest of the week. Love you. Namaste.